Hi, this is Stephen Van Camp Lewis, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about Cattleya walkeriana and Cattleya nobilior, and I want to show you some plants that I have in bloom and how I take care of them. Uh, so today is uh, March 7th, Saturday, it's the middle of the afternoon. Uh, it's kind of a gray, cloudy day, but um, I want to talk to you first about walkeriana and show you some of those flowers. And then I want to jump into the, the no, nobiliores and show you some of those flowers. Uh, but first, I, uh, you know, I want to talk about how both of those species are fairly similar. Uh, a lot of folks have trouble looking at them and differentiating them. Uh, both of them are, are fairly short plants, uh, fairly squat bulbs, and both, both species are very uh, drought tolerant and really resent having a lot of water around the roots. And you can grow them both fairly similarly. Um, you know, both of them, if you're in, a, in sort of a wet, humid area, both of them will do really well with mounts. Uh, if you don't want to mount them, you can put them in a basket. Or if you, you grow in an area that's kind of hot and dry like I have, <clears throat> uh, I grow them in uh, pots, clay pots like this with large grade orchiata bark. And they seem to do really well with that. Um, you know, and uh, I treat them fairly similarly to my other Cattleyas, but the fact that they're in clay pots with large grade bark means they're drying off fairly quickly. Uh, during the cold season, which is about now, um, typically they're, they're going to be dormant or, or, or blooming and not necessarily growing. And during that period, I'll water once or twice a week. And this is actually an increase over what I used to do. I used to grow and bloom them very well and I wouldn't water them for months on end and they did just fine because that's that's somewhat similar to how they grow in, in nature um, and you know th they'll still have uh, fog rolling in from the ocean but so, so they're still getting some moisture uh, almost nightly but uh, my, my friend Luis Hamilton Lima told me hey look uh, just because that's how they grow in nature doesn't mean you have to do that in cultivation and the best Brazilian um, nobilior and walkeriana growers, if you look at their bulbs, they're, they're big and fat, so they're not desiccating them um, to the extent that I was. And I had success that way, um, but I'm having better success this year with um, by watering once or twice uh, a month during the growing season. So, um, very, very bright light. They love it hot, uh, especially the nobiliors. Nobiliors do not do well with cold uh, temperatures at night in the in the winter you know I've had mine I get down to the mid 40s here in this greenhouse and uh, you know they seem to do well Walkeriana does very well down to that that temperature they don't they don't miss a beat so um, but ultimately you want to keep them as hot as you can as bright as you can and have them dry off fairly rapidly so this time of year like I said I, I water once or twice a week uh, during summertime when it's 105 degrees outside every day I hit them with water every evening um, and then by morning or, or at least by midday of the next day, they're, they're typically bone dry. So, that said, let's talk about some flowers. So, I'm going to start with the worst one and kind of work my way back. Now, this is a plant, um, this is a cerulea, which smells great. <clears throat> this is Walkerion Edwards. Uh, I got this from my friend um, Raphael, who has his YouTube channel, Taming the Orchid. And he, he was kind of getting out of this species. Uh, this is a first bloom. You can see that it's pretty wonky, right? It, its lip is, is odd. As the bud was developing, something happened, and it was very snub nose. It was like somebody took the bud and just went, bonked it on the nose. And you can see that came out in the lip. But as I've said in other videos, um, that's not too bad. Uh, these guys, well, most orchids will have their absolute worst bloom on the first bloom, and I suspect that's the case for this Edwards. But this one is, is potted in um, some some leca pellets, and this I actually when when Raphael sent this to me about a year ago, I guess I didn't repot it. I just left it the way it was. It, the media was great, and there's a little bit of uh, there's a thin layer of sphagnum on top. And you can see the bulbs are big and fat. Um, ultimately, this is a very healthy plant, very happy, 
and you know its first bloom came out a little wonky. That's okay. Uh, I don't. I'm not too worried about that. Now. I've got some other Wakarianas that are not blooming, and one of the interesting things about having these guys in bloom now is this species is typically a fall bloomer, although uh, as you can see, it, here it is springtime and it's blooming, um, but I went to the Heart of Texas Orchid Society um, show last weekend, um, so it was that weekend that straddled February and March, and some of the vendors had uh, Cattleya Wakariana and Nobiliar for sale. And these Wakarianas are also spiky. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is Estrella Dacalina by Sibling. Uh, Estrella is spelled incorrectly. Uh, this is a, a cross or um, a line breeding that is done by H&R originally, H&R Nurseries in Hawaii. And years and years ago, I had uh, one of these of the same cross and it was the best Wakariana I've ever seen in real life and I killed it when I moved to Texas um, you know I'm still kicking myself in the butt for that so when I saw that Estrella Dacalina by sibling was available at this year's show I said oh great I'm gonna pick up one of these and so one of the interesting things about uh, Catleys in general but especially Catlea Wakariana is you can guess what the bloom is going to look like if you see the root tips and you can see the, the color of the buds and the leaves. So for this particular one, now first of all, I know that Estrella Dacalina is a tipo. It's, it's a lavender, beautiful plant. Um, its siblings are typically tipo as well. So they're typically also lavender. So I came across this guy first. And I said, oh wow, Estrella Dacalina by Sibling, but the pseudo bulbs are dark red. Now, the bulb, uh, the um, buds here are also dark red. The root tips, and that's really important, the root tips were this dark vinicolor, almost purple red. And I said, this guy's going to be a rubra. And, you know, the buds are still developing, but I really think this is going to be darker, much darker than your average um, uh, Wakariana. And it's probably going to be much darker than the Estrella Dacalina. Because the Estrella Dacalina is, you know, it'll have green leaves like this. Its root tips will typically be pink, but not sort of a dark purple red and you won't see this much red spotting typically on the new growths. So I, I'm betting that this particular plant will be a rubra, which would be really cool. Now, the next day I went back and I went to the same vendor and I saw um, a plant like this. This was in bud at the time. The buds did not have any spots on them. The, the leaves do not have any spots on them. The bulbs don't really have any spots on them. And the root tips, uh, which I can't see anymore, I don't remember where I saw, but the root tips were bright green. So that means, you know, light colored bulbs, light colored buds, uh, light colored root tips to me means an alba. And hey, guess what? I got an alba. So, it smells good. <clears throat> so, a lot of the time for these guys, you can see, you can kind of guess what color uh, the flowers are going to be simply by knowing that the root tips, leaves, and bulbs um, are going to be uh, are going to be a hint at what the flower is going to be. And I was right. So hopefully now I have an Estrella Dacalina that's going to be rubra and now I have an alba. So this would be great to add to my collection and have both color varieties because I'd like to do my own breeding. And having both color varieties in my collection is is really exciting. So I've shown you some of my my Wakarianas, and I want to show you now some of my Nobiliors, and I'm I'm really excited about the Nobiliors. So, uh, like I said, the Nobiliors grow similarly to the the Wakarianas, um, and oh, I, I do want to mention before I move on, uh, both Wakarianas and Nobiliors have a, a new growth 
for the, the flowers. So let's look at this guy. So in most Cattleyas, the new the flowers will come out the top, and you'll see the flowers come out here. However, both Nobiliora and Wakariana create an entirely new growth for the flowers. So this new growth has one job, and that's to bloom, and then it'll die. Um, but it does put out roots, and you can see here the, the buds come out straight up, and then they eventually rotate down. So, the nobiliors grow, like I said, similarly to the wakarianas, but in nature they're a little drier. And you have two varieties. You have your, your sort of regular variety, which grows um, <clears throat> drier or more xeric than wakariana. And you have a variety, a malii, which grows in even drier conditions and requires less water during winter, typically if they're in nature. Here in cultivation, that's, that's less important. So, here is a, a nobilior, it smells amazing. Uh, this is, as you can see, a fairly large plant. Um, the blooms are lavender. This is a, a typical Tipo variety. Um, nothing too special about this one. In fact, the the, the segments on these petals are kind of a little wonky this year. Last year, these, this guy was much flatter, and uh, all the petals and sepals were on a plane, uh, on a flat plane. And so for whatever reason, this year, this particular bloom spike has bloomed out with three flowers, which is normal. Um, but the segments are, are, are odd. Um, some of the, you know, the, the sepals are, are, are twisted and folded back, and then the petals are kind of swooping forward. And the color is a little odd. It's it's not quite as dark pink as it was last year. But uh, I do want to show you the new growth with this two flowers or two buds coming out. Uh, you can see that it is putting out new roots. And so, and I want to show you a, an old bloom spike is this guy. So this is what bloomed last spring and you can see it dies off when it's done. So between your your growth bulbs, your pseudo bulbs, you'll have these, these spikes. So this one will, will bloom out and it'll eventually die and turn into just a, a dead spent bulb. Another thing I want to show you with these guys is, is how much they ramble in the pot. You know, this, this is a large plant that's just spilling out over its pot. It's a very large pot. I suspect it'll walk out of this pot this year and I don't entirely know what I'm going to do with it, whether I chop it up or just put it in an even bigger pot and let it keep going. Uh, I suspect I'll end up doing the latter. But so you can see the roots. I don't know. Hopefully you can see the roots all spread out through this. Um, and again, I water these guys every day in summer. They get time-release fertilizer um, starting about this time of year through the growth season. And as long as you keep watering these, I will typically typically get two to three separate flushes of growth in a single year. So as you can see, this one is blooming, but it's also putting out a new growth. So this will be my first flush of new growth for the year. This will mature in a couple of months and then it'll put out new bulbs and will continue growing. And then I'll probably get another flush of new growth in August and it'll grow through November or even into December. So this is, this is a massive plant. This is typo or typical, and I'm going to put it back and swap it out for another one. Now this, this is a big deal. This, um, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, the bulbs are humongous. And let me put this up next to uh, this cerulea, next to this wakariana. And you can really see the size difference in the bulbs and in the flowers, you know. Big difference, big, big difference. And these bulbs are absolutely enormous. Um, so you can see my thumb is dwarfed by these bulbs. Same with here. 
Um, but possibly, even more important, this is a cerulea. Now, cerulea nobiliores are um, not common, and you can't often buy these. Their breeding is also far, far behind typical um, nobiliore breeding. So typical nobiliar breeding is bred to be flat, so the, the, the flower is on a plane, kind of like my hand, and then you have the lip jutting out. So this one doesn't quite meet those specifications. We've got some twisting in the petals here. You can see that um, the, the sepals come back in here. We have the windows, right? We have these windows. There's spaces between the petals and sepals. But even with those deficiencies, this is probably, I'm going to go out on a limb here, I'm going to say that this is probably the single best Cerulean nobiliore in the United States right now. I, I have not seen uh, actual or even photos of a Cerulea that's better than this. And look how big this thing is. It's a monster. It's, it's, this is almost hand size, right? Um, I am absolutely, this is the first time I've seen this blooming. Uh, this is number one by number two, and those are the parents. Uh, this, is, this is bred by Francisco Miranda. I bought this from Francisco years ago, and it's just been growing and growing and growing, and finally it put out a bloom. So this is actually its first bloom. It's got three flowers on the spike. Uh, there were two buds that aborted early on, so this one tried to have five flowers on its first blooming. It put out these monster flowers absolutely beautiful i've seen a lot of photos of these of this particular cross that's it, it's not super great a lot of the time and that's because it's uh, the cerulea breeding for nobilio are so far behind this is this is a big deal this i'm so happy to have this particular plant um, i'm going to take a bunch of pictures and post it to social media and i'm going to self these guys and i'm going to breed this one um, and see if I can get some more amazing flowers from future subsequent generations. But you can see how a healthy plant is going to have big fat bulbs. And look at these roots. These roots are just, this guy is walking out of the pot. The roots are going back into the pot. And again, I water this every day in the summer, the heat of summer. And it's got time release fertilizer. It just gets blasted with Texas sun. Um, I have a, uh, I grow this in full sun from about sunrise to about two or three, which is when the shade of the oak trees kicks in, but it's got uh, a 50% shade cloth. And so here in, in, in the middle of Texas, a 50% shade cloth through the heat of summer is very, very bright. It's very hot. And these guys love it. Same with the Wakarianas. Now finally, this is a, a, a bit of a smaller plant. This is, this is more of an average size plant. So I'm actually wondering if that cerulea is 4N or if it's a polyploid plant. I don't really know. There's only one way to find out. That's with the laboratory. Um, but this particular clone is an Alba. It's a, it's a really nice Alba. Uh, Alba is also very similarly uh, not common here in the United States at least. It's a little more common in, uh, in Brazil. But you can see I've got a uh, spike coming out here. I've got three buds on this one, uh, separate new growth. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know if I'll uh, self this one or maybe cross it with this, this other Wakariana Alba and create a Cattleya Brazilian Jewel, um, which is the primary hybrid, an artificial primary hybrid between Nobilior and Wakariana. But also, this one grows alongside my other Wakarianas and Nobiliores and gets blasted with heat and sun and loves it. So, uh, with that, I think that's all of my plants that are, are blooming right now or in spike uh, for the Wakarianas and Nobiliores. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.